This is the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 16th, 2023. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state society of CPAs. Ed Zollers and this week coming to you from Phoenix, I'll talk to you about a number of things that went on this week. First, a couple of IRS press releases we'll look at. We'll tell you that the IRS had announced this week that they're going to begin the filing season on January 23rd. That's when returns will begin to be accepted by the service for 2022 calendar year taxpayers. So we'll see that then. We also had announcements this week of extension of due dates for taxpayers in California affected by the uh, storms that have been ravaging the state over the past few weeks. And we'll talk a bit about that, what that affects. The fact that we did have new counties added. Uh, we had a, one set initially, then we had another set added. And as I record this on Saturday, it's my understanding that there is more rain coming to California. So we'll see if that expands one more time for additional counties before we get done. We then look at the at a basically amended return request uh, for the uh, for the research credit. Get that correct. The IRS has now revised the instructions for Form 6765 to outline that exact set of information we've been talking about since back in late 2021 that you had to provide with the research credit claim. That's now going into the draft instructions for 6765, which suggests that, yeah, we're pretty much set on how that's going to be working. We are also going to talk about a case where a taxpayer lost trying to exclude housing provided by his employer in Australia from his taxable income. Uh, didn't win that one. We'll talk also about the two IRS memos that are interesting. They were both written by the IRS internally on January 10th. They were published on the 13th and they have no redactions, which of course for chief counsel advice is always something you tend to see at least something redacted from the advice, but we didn't this time. And usually it takes them a little time to review it before it gets out. And I think in this case, it's because these are both theoretical, hypothetical, I should say, scenarios, and they're meant to get the IRS out there rattling a few sabers early before people start filing 22 returns, and they both relate to cryptocurrency. The first one looked at attempts to claim a loss on a stable coin that dropped dramatically in value. Can't imagine what that one could be. And now went from $1 per coin, which is where stable coins are supposed to stay, to down below one cent per coin. And the question, well, can I claim, you know, I had tons of money in this thing and it's now worth virtually nothing. Can I claim a loss on that? And we'll discover the services idea about why you can't right now. And if you actually could under the ordinary loss theory that they're proposing here, they pointed out that as an individual, it would be a miscellaneous item of deduction and you'd be out of luck anyway. We'll also talk about one that's probably getting more coverage right now because it sounds absurd, but it is how Congress wrote the law. If you make a donation of more than $5,000 of cryptocurrency to a charity, you're going to have to get that formally appraised. You cannot simply use the quoted price from a market. Uh, and we'll talk about why that doesn't work, even though it seems like isn't that what the appraiser is going to end up doing, which should probably, but that's not relevant. You need to have the formal appraisal. We'll talk about why and how that goes. But well, let's start out with the announcement from the IRS that came out on the 12th in Internal Revenue Service news release IR 2023-05 entitled, The IRS Sets January 23rd as Official Start to 2023 Tax Season, More Help Available for Taxpayers This Year. And what this tells us is that returns will be accepted by the IRS beginning on January the 23rd. So that is the first date you can electronically file returns with the service. Now, I know most of us have to be concerned not just about when the IRS will accept returns, but when they will accept all the forms we need, which usually isn't right away. And then beyond that, when our tax software will have the forms that they're going to accept. So probably there won't be a lot of returns we can actually file on January 23rd for a lot of us in our offices and clients obviously haven't got data in or got their 1099s. But at least once data gets in and once the forms are ready, the IRS will be accepting things beginning January 23rd. The news release also contains a reminder 
that this year, the deadline date is April the 18th. You know, we kind of missed the 15th for two years. We would have had it because of COVID and the various extensions we got there. So now we're under the weird numbers there that will come into it. And it also tells us that they expect most earned income tax credit refunds, you know, for people that file right away at the beginning, you know, those are automatically have to be delayed by the law until the middle of February at the earliest. And they said, well, they would expect those early filers looking for earned income tax credit, those to be out by the end of February and in the taxpayer's hands if there are no problems on the returns and they ask for either the debit card or direct deposit. If you're asking for checks, well, checks take longer. So you won't really see those right away. Next up, let's talk about the relief the IRS gave us for California storm victims. This is Internal Revenue Service news release IR 202303. This one came out on the 10th of January. And entitled IRS California Storm Victims Qualify for Tax Relief, April 18th deadline, other dates move to May 15th. Okay. Now, this of course relates to the declaration of a disaster area in California due to that major league level of rain and flooding that's occurred in California over the past couple of weeks. And the relief applies beginning on anything with a deadline on January 8th or later, and effectively goes for deadlines from January 8th to May 15th. So if you have something due in that deadline, in that date, and the taxpayer either lives in one of the affected counties or has records and books tied up in that area. Now, the ones that live in those counties, the IRS, as they always do in this, tell us that they'll be able to identify those basically by their mailing address. So as long as you're using the right mailing address, they should be able to automatically identify those who you know, are essentially qualified based on that. But they also warn you that if you otherwise would meet the qualifications, you have documents, records, things in that area, but you don't have an address in the right county, there are ways the IRS tells you to contact them in order to get this relief for filing. So most deadlines are pushed back to May 15th. That would include uh, business returns uh, due on March 15th. That would include, you know, the individual returns that we do on April 18th. That would include various other items there, including the estimated tax payments due coming up on basically the one that would be due on the, well, not 15th, really it's the 17th, that you'd have an estimate due then. It's also going to be an estimate due on the 18th of April. All of these have been pushed back. Now, the Franchise Tax Board, nor at announcement, they normally, you know, follow these things. They've had those announcements out in the past. And at least Spidell's now reporting that they will accept this time as well. So the Franchise Tax Board deadlines will be similarly extended for those that fall due between the 8th of January and the 15th of May. Now, it also applies to your payroll tax returns that are due on basically anything that's due on the 31st, the end of this month, the W-2s and the like, as well as those things due, I should say not W-2s, the, well, W-2s, I guess everything's in there, and the 941s and those things due, but also it will apply to the 941s due at April 30th. I believe it applies to W-2s. You better check that because that goes to Social Security. We've got to remember it doesn't go to the IRS. But anyway, the, the payroll tax reports definitely due to the IRS are pushed back so you could file your fourth quarter nine, your fourth quarter 941s, your 940, and other such payroll documents with the IRS along with the first quarter ones could be filed as late as May 15th. Now, obviously, when the first quarter ones, that's not that big a break because April 30th, May 15th, not a huge break, but you know, you got a little bit of break there. Now, payroll tax deposits are a little bit of a different concept. In those cases, we don't get that same sort of break. It's not as if we stop worrying about paying payroll taxes from here to eternity. The theory being, if you can get back operating and you're paying payroll, then probably you can make the deposits here shortly. So the way the rule goes at this point is payroll deposits that were nor that are due from January the 8th through January the 23rd will be due or timely made as long as you make those deposits by January the 23rd. 
So that, that's going to be effectively how this one gets handled as we get into that side of the equation. Now, the IRS also notes they will continue to update this relief. Um, counties and other things, if we have expansions, as I said, with this weekend's rain, we'll see if it expands to even more counties. Currently covers a lot of California. You know, we have counties, definitely counties in the major metro areas are covered at this point, both those in Southern California and up there in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have those basically all covered. Uh, my guess is we're going to get a huge proportion of California counties that are covered at this point. And that includes really big counties like Riverside, where by you get to the far eastern end of Riverside County, you're probably not affected, right? If you're sitting on across the Colorado River from Arizona, because uh, Riverside County goes way long distance. But still, Riverside County is in the mix because if you're in western Riverside County, which is where the larger population is, then, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd definitely still be impacted. So keep track of that. If you have clients in California, you want to review the counties that are covered as well as whether your clients are in those counties and understand where the due dates can be will be moving this year. Next up, we're going to talk about the instructions for Form 6765. Uh, revised on January, revision date will be January 2023. And this is a credit for increasing research activities. The draft was issued as of January 12th of 2023. And what this does is take something that had been just in IRIS memos, other documents, and is now moving it into the instructions, which is going to make it a little more obvious that, yeah, we told you about this. And my guess is they're getting it out now. So they can say, look, it's been in there for a year. So next year, when they transition to the rule, where if you send in your amended return without this data, when they get around to looking at it, they will just reject it, claim it was never filed, that if you don't file this, it doesn't count as filed. And if your statute's gone out of, out of line in the interim, tough luck. Currently, through January of next year, early January of next year, the IRS will send back the notice if you file before that date and you'll have 45 days to prepare that information. So even if the statute would end or had ended before they sent the notice out or would end before the 45 days, you still get the 45 days to fix it. Well, by putting this notice out, that means the IRS can say, no, we, we wasn't unfair. When you went to prepare everything, this was in the instructions, you should have noticed it. So remember in 2021, the IRS put this notice out initially stating that they were going to take this position that you had to provide this information right up front, easy to read, you know, not, not buried in a 300 page document that the IRS had to go search all through it to find it, but you had to give them directions. If you want to put a 300 page document, that's fine, but you better tell them the exact page number everything's on that you need to be filing with it. So that, that we have discussed that one before it was modified early in 22. This now actually just brings it into the 6765 draft instructions. So what those instructions do now is they essentially tell you the, the stuff that you have to attach. And what that tells you is there are five hours of information must be identified and provided with your claim and must be clearly identified this. The factual basis of your research credit claim, the research activities you perform, the individuals who performed early, each early research activity, and you may identify the individuals who performed each research activity by listing their title and position. You don't, you can list the person or you can list title and position. Uh, the information each of those individuals sought to discover and the total amount of employee qualified employee wages, total qualified supply expenses and total contract expense paid or incurred for section 14 research credit claim or complete this form 6765. Uh, if you submit a credit, if you submit a credit or other document, please identify the exact pages that contain those five pieces of information. So that's part of what's coming into this mode. Now, the other thing is they introduced some information for Bipartisan Budget Act partnerships. If you remember, the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015 radically modified the rules for partnership exams. And in this case, what's important, when a partnership goes to revise a previously filed return. Generally, partnerships that don't qualify to opt out of the BBA regime have to file an administrative adjustment request. They cannot file a simple amended return. The guidance reminds those partnerships who may be filing this research credit claim 
that they must submit form 8985 and 8986 to the IRS and send the forms 8986 to the partners. Uh, the BBA partnerships do not need to provide the five information, five information 8985 and 8986, where the five items of information are included with the 6765 attached to the BBA partnerships administrative adjustment request. They tell you basically how to put it together. Then they remind the partners that BBA partnerships cannot file amended returns. They must instead file AARs. A BBA administrative adjustment request is statutorily provided type amended filing used to change partnership related items for any partnership taxable year. If you're a partner of such a BBA and filing return that includes a section 41 credit for increasing research activities in BPA partnerships administrative adjustment request, you may but are not required to include the five items of information with your return to which the 8970 is attached if the BBA partnership has provided the information with its own administrative adjustment request. So it gives some background there if you're dealing with partnerships. Now let's go. Basically, somebody's better provide that information in that case. Next up, we're going to talk about a court case here of Smith v. Commissioner. Tax Court Memorandum Decision 2023-6. This case was decided on January the 12th. Now, this taxpayer actually has had two, two different tax court decisions, both of which now have gone against them. We're going to talk about this one this time. They relate to the same case. But this decided the actual basic issue underlying the IRS, underlying the position. Now, this was a taxpayer who took a job with the defense contractor in Australia. It was Raytheon. Now, Raytheon told the taxpayer before he took the job, they said, well, you know, you're, you're basically going to be, this job's in Australia. We will provide you with the housing. Or alternatively, we can provide you with essentially pay for equivalent housing if you get that, you know, if you basically submit it and we figure out you're not trying to get a mansion or something, you know, something, we'll give you something comparable to what we were going to provide. Well, the taxpayer took that job in Australia and he was told when he got this notice from Raytheon that an employer provided housing, whether it was a housing or the money they'd give him, would be considered taxable. Now, in this case, the actual housing was provided by the U.S. Department of Defense. And that's because Raytheon was a defense contractor, and so they were using some government-owned housing. And so he actually got a 1099 for this uh, housing amount instead of having it in a W-2. But he got it. He was told it's going to be taxable. And so for two years, he got this 1099. He reported on his return as taxable. But sometime after filing the second return, he decided it wasn't taxable. And he went ahead and filed amended returns for those two years, asking for the money back. And he omitted the income, or what he really did was, he went back and on the Schedule C's he had filed for those years, he just put a line in there. You know, he had the income reported. He then just went down and had the deduction reported, saying it was employee, you know, employer fringe benefit removing it entirely from income. Now, the problem here is that under Section 119, which is where he's trying to claim it could be excluded, under Section 119, housing can only be excluded if it is required for your job that you stay in the employer-provided housing, if it is for the convenience of the employer, not the employee, and number three, if it is on the employer's premises. Now, in this case, the housing in question he was provided was 11 miles from the place he normally worked. So this had actually been taken to court before by a couple of other people in this same location, and the tax court had decided against both of them. But he tried to argue a little differently, or at least his case was different. And of course, he did point out, he said, well, Okay, maybe it wasn't even owned by Raytheon or whatever, but it still really was their level because at least in theory, they were able to supervise him. They were able to, you know, know his comings and goings. They were able to control the people that he could meet with and all of these various items related to security. He also claimed that he did uh, at this time various work at home, filled out various reports and records that he would do at home. Unfortunately, the tax court found 
that this one was not on the pre taxpayer's premises. And they said that's strictly required. They noted that if we just said it just had to be owned by the employer, and well, since they own it, it's their premises. And the court kind of pointed out that they didn't really even own this one, but let's ignore that. They, they said that that would simply gut the provision in the bill that said it had to be on the employer's premises. They said the obviously the point of that was you couldn't just provide housing all throughout the town. It also had to be a case where it was necessary for you to be there to be for the convenience of the employer. So you had to be available 24-7. So it's worked in cases like where you have somebody who, let's say, was a manager of a hotel or an apartment complex, and they need to be there to handle complaints or issues that might arise anytime 24-7. So because of that, they had to stay on premises. That's the type of case that has worked. This particular case did not work. Now, probably a part of this is that this is a retired uh, Air Force uh, person. And I think probably, you know, they're thinking about all the stuff that there are certain benefits one gets being the armed services that are non-taxable, but they write special rules there. When you are considered to be a contractor for a private company, even that contractor is working with DOD, you're not a member of the armed services anymore and things are a little different. In any event, he loses in this case. They said, nope, cannot be excluded, was not on the employer's premises. You don't meet any of the requirements for 119. And so because of that, the entire amount that you received is considered taxable income. Next up, we have interesting weekend here. This one's kind of interesting. Coming up on Friday. On Friday, the IRS issued two separate legal memorandums, chief counsel advice, and their chief counsel advice in this case will be 2023-02-011 and 012 will be our pair. Both of them, they, they have a number of unique features that are similar. Number one, each one was actually issued by the IRS internally on January the 10th, but went out for publication on the 13th. Each one has the same author and is written to the same other IRS employee both of whom are in the counsel's office, right? So it's internal to the counsel's office. It also, both of them are not talking about an actual taxpayer situation that's in front of the either party at this time or in front of the service at this time, but rather they talk about two hypothetical situations. Now, and they talk about hypothetical situations for things that supposedly occurred in 22 one of which occurred at December 31st of 22, which was 10 days before the memo was written. So it's an unusual set of chief counsel advice. Bottom line is, I think the whole point of this is, this is a interesting and unique way the IRS is using to announce their position in a way that, you know, seems to, well, no, 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 we're just talking to ourselves. We're not really telling everybody this or doing formal guidance, but it gets the message out. So we have this new chief counsel advice. I don't know if this is the way the IRS now plans to get around, um, you know, having to do, you know, when people complain about the FAQs, is it like, well, okay, see, this isn't FAQ anymore. It's on the website. We're just talking to ourselves. And you guys, tax analysts, sued years ago and said we have to publish these things when we do it. So we're, we're just publishing this stuff that we didn't really want to tell you, you understand. But, you know, hey, you guys are going to find out. We're seeing the IRS do this a bit more. If you remember when they talked about the IRS doing exams for Paycheck Protection Program loans and treating them as taxable, if they didn't set, if, if they really didn't qualify under the SBA rules, even though the SBA had granted forgiveness, um, that one was also then interestingly followed up with a news release. We'll see if these are followed up with news releases as well. Right, where the IRS kind of does the back door. It's not really even an FAQ, it's not a notice, it's not anything formal, but it's basically you're you're warned. This is our position. Now, this particular one takes a look on a loss claimed on a taxpayer who has a investment in a cryptocurrency that they bought in 2022 and by the end of the year was worth virtually nothing. So now, I think almost everybody I mentioned this to who knows much about crypto 
is saying almost right off the front, they read it and go, this is Terra USD they're talking about, right? We're talking about the Terra Luna collapse. And if you're involved, if you've been around, uh, there's, I know there's been a lot of collapses in crypto th this year, so you lose track. But that was one of those. The theory of a stable coin was that it had a method where its price would always be $1 per unit. And this was an algorithmic version that weirdly was tied to another uh, cryptocurrency. But in theory, the way they structured it, this particular Terra USD would always be worth $1. And the advantage of a stable coin in that point was, well, it gives you some place to park your, you know, your investment that wasn't in a fiat currency, right? But was a stable store of value, you know? So you didn't worry about the fact that, you know, your Bitcoin other thing was going up, down, left, right. It's pricing all over the place. You had this stable store when you didn't want to be in the market. As we would say, Terra USD collapsed horrendously. And yes, it is currently trading for under one cent per unit. You, you can actually go, and the funny part is in, in this memo, they give you a website to go look at pricing on these things. And yeah, you, you can go see the current pricing of the what's remains of Terra uh, is basically, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not even worth pennies on the dollar, right? It's worth fractions of pennies on the dollar. So yeah, total collapse. So the question becomes, you know, could somebody in this situation claim a deduction for the, this horrendous loss, right? And, you know, could they claim it under 165A under either a theory that they had abandoned the, uh, you know, the item in question or that it was simply worthless. And so they could write it off that way. Now. The one problem we got in both cases is these people are still holding the coin at the end of the year because, you know, maybe, may, maybe it'll all come back, right? It'll all come back. We'll get it back to a dollar per unit. And if you buy that, I've got this bridge in Brooklyn you might want to buy. Um, yeah, I, I really don't think it's going back. I, I, I think Terra USD is dead. I, I, I think that ship has sailed long ago. But nevertheless, you'll have people hold it on the chance it will maybe come back. And I don't want to have sold it and gotten rid of it. The other reason I don't want to sell it is because if I sell it, then that would be a capital loss. Now, a lot of people who were crypto bros went into crypto big time, which means they didn't keep any money in any of those crooked investments, you know, stocks, bonds, where everything's rigged, right? Or even banks, everything's rigged. So they put it all in crypto because that was all good, you know, good, nice, wonderful, upstanding people. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that worked out well. Um, anyway, bottom line, they went whole hog into crypto. There are a whole lot of people that did that. Some of them even borrowed on credit cards to do it. So we have some, some people went a bit overboard, not all. And there, you know, I, but there are that group that did. So the problem being with that group is they're not going to have any sort of capital gain that could absorb this, you know, five or six figure capital loss. And as we all know, that's a $3,000 a year problem, right? You know, it goes at three grand per year. That's how you have to write it off because you can't take it against other income except the extent of three grand. So they thought, and the theory being, and I know it's what the IRS is trying to shut down. We need to find some way to make it ordinary deduction. Well, losses under 165 generally, except for worthless securities, are considered to be ordinary losses. So if we get the deduction under 165A, right, which is separate from casualty theft, those sorts of things. If we get out 165A, then under 165A, well, that, that should be ordinary. We should be able to get it. So the IRS is, is setting up this theory, knowing that people are going to try a position based on this at some point. So the IRS points out a few problems here. Well, first thing is they found there was no evidence this person took any steps to truly abandon the crypto coin. You know, they still had control of the wallet. They still had control of the item, right? They hadn't actually abandoned it. Um, and there are some ways proposed you could abandon a cryptocurrency. 
um, you know, transfer it to a wallet you have no control whatsoever over. Uh, actually, a wallet nobody does has control over, then nobody could really get it. Um, things like that. There are various odd ways, but this one didn't get into any of that discussion. It was not, you know, you just held it, you, but you claimed you'd really, yeah, I don't plan to do anything with it, so I abandoned it. Well, they, of course, ruled that that doesn't work. You've got to take some active role to abandon it. Now, it could get the same result if the asset truly became absolutely worthless, right? And they point out that there are two worthlessness provisions in the law. There is the worthlessness provision for security. Now, they did note that cryptocurrency is not a security by the Internal Revenue Code definition of what is a security. We won't worry about what the SEC and everybody is talking about here and all the rules there. Under the IRS, he said, under the provisions of the code that reference the worthless security rules under 165, there is a specific definition of a security. And guess what? Written way before anything like crypto existed, so crypto is not going to count for that purpose. So he said, so the worthless security rule, which, by the way, would lead to a capital loss, doesn't apply. But they also said, secondly, it's not really worthless. You can still, there are exchanges that still trade. You know, Terra, Terra can still be traded on exchanges for virtually nothing. But there's still some trading. I checked, you know, I, I went on and checked the site there as reference yesterday. And yeah, I could still find it. So it's still there. It's still being quoted for this really ridiculously low price. But we still have that in play. So because of that, they said, well, you can't get a 165A uh, deduction for this because you haven't done anything that would trigger a 165A loss. Now, that what they didn't discuss, and what obviously is a way some people did, who are willing to take the capital loss, is sell it to a third party for a nominal amount. Right? You sell it to a third party for a nominal amount, and they pick it up. So, you know, heck, you could sell it for what it's trading for, because it's probably not, you know, <laughs> that's not that much money anyway. But Nevertheless, but even then, you sell it for a nominal amount to get rid of it because it's not worth doing. That's a sale that would trigger the capital loss. Of course, the problem is it's a capital loss. But the IRS noted another problem with the 165 theory. They will tell you, if you take a look at Section 67, Section 67 is what defines what is a miscellaneous itemized deduction. And if you look there, you're going to find that except for a few specified categories, which this would not fall into, Losses under 165A are considered for an individual to be miscellaneous itemized deductions. And that, that's a problem because obviously Section 67G added by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act says that you don't get a, any deduction. Any, you can't put anything. Your, your allowed deduction for miscellaneous itemized deductions will be zero, right, from 2018 to 2025 under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So they're saying, even if your 165A theory works, you're not going to be able to just take an ordinary loss above the line. You're going to have to take a loss, right, that will be totally non-deductible. You might, might work on some states. There are states that still allow those miscellaneous side my deductions to be deducted at the state level. But again, that's probably not worth what you want. So in any event, the IRS, and obviously the, this is out there, to put the IRS on record as saying, this is what we think about this. And if you try this, you know, we already are on the record saying, yes, well, we're going to challenge this on exam. When the agent comes in and says, what about this? Chief counsel is going to say, yep, go after it. That's our position. Now, the next one is more likely to be run into, I think. Um, and I think it's correct. And it sounds absurd. Well, largely because it is. But I'm not going to defend this as not being absurd, but I do defend it that it's exactly what the law says. And if it's going to be fixed, it will take the United States Congress to fix it. We just got a new chair of Ways and Means. Go, 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 go tell Representative Smith uh, he can take this on right now, right? Uh, if we can fix this one now. So, hi, sir. Representative Smith, Missouri, we got something for you. New chair of Ways and Means, you can fix this one. This is Chief Counsel Advice 2023 Again, issued same date, same two IRS employees involved, right? Written on the 10th, released on the 13th, no redaction, whole standard, simple thing. Internal Revenue Code, Section 170, F11C, requires an appraisal for any donation in excess of $5,000 given to a charity. Now, 
it goes on and has at 170 F 11 A to uh, to capital I, you know, two little I's, one cap I is the way it works. It's kind of a long reference. There they list specific items that will be exempted. If you donate those things, you are exempted uh, from having to have your appraisal done. So what that exempts in this case are a few things. And, you know, one of those things you have is an exemption in this case, as we go there, and let me get back up here. Uh, if you have cash, okay, it's not that, right? Again, remember this whole bit about it's not fiat currency. Well, cash means U.S. currency, fiat currency, so it's not cash. Number two, stock and trade. Probably not. I mean, theoretically, it could be, but that's a whole different dealer in this, so we'll assume that's not it. Inventory, again, similar dealer. Property held primarily for sale to customers in the ordinary course of business. Again, theoretically, could be, but it's not for this guy holding this, you know, Terra. Uh, probably not, who just was dabbling in a crypto bro, dabbling in it. Publicly traded securities, okay? Uh, intellectual property and certain vehicles. Now, you know, doesn't really seem to be intellectual property in the sense of patents, copyrights, that sort of thing. Um, it's definitely not a car, but it is traded on exchange, so would it qualify as a publicly traded security? Well, you may have remembered what we talked about earlier in this case, right? That we had a definition of what's a publicly traded security. And cryptocurrency is not anything that's on that list. Remember, we talked about that before. Again, Congress, again, references the definition for the tax law of what's a publicly traded security. And, you know, all this stuff isn't. Remember, one of the theoretical advantages of crypto was that it wasn't regulated by the government. And it wasn't, you know, being, it didn't be governed by things like the SEC, et cetera. Whether that works or not, it's a different problem long term. But bottom line, you know, it was being promoted by many people as something that wasn't a traditional security. Well, it's not a security. Uh, so even though you might say that, look, the only smart way to do this would be to take the exchange numbers, just like I did yesterday. And just like the IRS's other memo referred to for the worthless things, you went in there to see what's it worth. But the problem is here, this is black letter law written by Congress. It clearly says everything must be, every, every donation made must have a appraisal, a qualified appraisal, formal appraisal uh, involved and obtained for it before you claim the deduction. And that only is exempt for this limited set of things that we specifically as U.S. Congress name. There is no provision in there that allows the IRS to add to that list. Any changes to that list have to be made by the United States Congress. So Mr. Smith, yeah, Mr. Smith has gone to Washington. So Mr. Smith in Washington, uh, chair of ways and means, you need to change the list if you want to get rid of this ruling. Easy issue. Advice, I give you your first weekend, sir. Right. We'll take care of that. I could tell that's Mr. Wyden, too, but he's been there for a while, so he, he might not be as open currently to getting suggestions. So we'll give it to Mr. Smith that, that he can take that suggestion and work with it in ways and means. But Congress would have to make this change. So that'd be a congressional law. Now, it doesn't sound absurd to get a, you know, to get what's going to be an appraisal that almost certainly they're going to do based on comparable sales. And they're going to go back and reference these exchanges. Sure. Absurd. Are you going to pay for it? Yeah, you're going to have to get a qualified appraiser. The law has rules for that. And so it's going to cost you money to get this appraisal performed. Is it absurd? Yes. Got any chance to get around it? No. So now they ask a second question. Let's assume this taxpayer went out, got the cryptocurrency, looked on the exchange, got this price, put it in, found out, oh, when, when she went to prepare a return, she discovered that, oh, well, supposedly I, I'm going to go ahead and do an 8283, right? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and prepare part one, section B, the 8283, attach it to the return and claim the deduction. In the example here, she claimed $10,000. Now it was based on the exchange. She did not obtain or attempt to attain a qualified appraisal. And she argued no appraisal was required because it had a readily ascertainable value based on the value trapped in the Christian claims 
which is very true, very correct. I'm not even going to, that, that's not a point being argued. So now the question is, as reasonable as that sounds, and it sounds reasonable, can this person still get their $10,000 deduction under the reasonable cause exception, which exists? You can still get your deduction if you had a reasonable cause for not getting the appraisal. Well, unfortunately, and what the IRS does in this case is they go back and they look to an old court case, right? And they look at the case, well, not old, actually, Pancrest case from 2021. And that was a case where a taxpayer also tried to get a reasonable basis, right, for donated property. Um, and Pancrest even said they relied on the advice of tax professionals. But the court found that in Pancrest, that wasn't reasonable. And why wasn't it? Because on its face, the, on its face, basically, if you take a look and you read on the face of the form, uh, let me go back, get my form right, correct here. Forget that a little distance, kind of crazy. 8283, yeah, add the form number, right? On the form 8283, on its face, it mentions appraisals in certain cases. It then, in the instructions, it refers you to discusses the need for an appraisal. Taxpayers are, and this kind of goes back to the FBAR rulings, uh, taxpayers are basically responsible for reading the return. And had she read the return and read the 8283, she would have discovered she had to have an appraisal. Uh, so it's not reasonable to grant her the exception for not getting the appraisal in this case because, you know, she has a responsibility to have read, and had she read it, it would have been clear she had an appraisal, and she had no real other reason to get it aside from ignorance. And in, in essence, the theory being, and they go back to Pancrats, that the courts are now interpreting that as willful ignorance, right? You know, you have responsibility. If you decide not to fulfill your responsibilities, then you're going you're gonna to have to bear the consequences, and that means no reasonable cause. So what they're telling you here, and remember, we talked about this before this year, multiple times, about the tax, about the fact the IRS is getting very, very picky and taking people to court on large donations, winning, where they make minor mistakes on the documentation rules. You know, you may remember the Albrecht case for that woman who donated property to the museum and had that deed that talked about, oh yeah, she gave it, no restrictions, no anything, except as provided in the gift agreement. And there was no gift agreement at all. But because that deed was the only acknowledgement she had, and it referenced the gift agreement, that internally, it by itself indicated it could not be the full agreement, even if there was no gift agreement out there. So the court held, sorry, you lose that. So, Bottom line, and you may remember earlier case this year in Kiefer, we talked about that case as well from Texas, where a taxpayer, one of the reasons the taxpayer got in trouble there was that they had given uh, the asset to a donor advised fund and DAFs are required under one, section 170 F8 to specifically state that when they accept a donation, in addition to all the standard stuff you have in the acknowledgement, they have to state that you know, that they have full legal control over the item. And it didn't state that. And the taxpayer lost the entire deduction. The IRS is getting picky on this. And that's become a problem. What they're telling you right now is they're going to be picky on this as well. So if you have a client who gave, who tried to transfer to a charity, cryptocurrency, and its value is above five grand, your two choices are to claim less than five grand as value. Or... Uh, get an appraiser to appraise it as uh, and find somebody who would who would who would agree they're a qualified appraiser for cryptocurrency to get that done. So as weird as it is, it is, I think, what the law requires. Well, this has been the current federal tax developments for the week of January the 17th, 2023 or 16th. We're doing 16th this week, right? I, I'm ignoring the holiday on Monday for this. Um, so we'll do the 16th this time. Uh, as always, you can email me at zollers at currentprotectdevelopments.com if you want to ask a quick question. Uh, I also do monitor the Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Illinois, Minnesota, Washington, 
And if somebody posts something in a discussion areas of Idaho society, I take a look there. So if you have questions, you can pop in there. Otherwise, we plan another week. Next week, of course, we'll be getting ready for the first submissions to the IRS because the 23rd is Monday, the next Monday. So be ready for that. That'll be the real beginning of tax season. Otherwise, take care. Uh, have a good week for whatever kind of week one can have as we're approaching rapidly the real start of tax season. And we'll see you back here next week for current federal tax developments.